Well, well speaking of hitting a stride, gang, let's go ahead and get our stride started. It is a little after seven, but it's November 20th. And we're going to start with uh, a look at the Book of Acts. Now, as this uh, overview begins, it describes the Book of Acts in its title as the Acts of the Apostles. And I just want to just clarify that that is one of the ways with which uh, it's sometimes talked about. It's uh, uh, some scholars will call it the Acts of the Apostles. It's the activity. It's what, what they did. Some will describe it, though, differently, and some Bibles will have it not as the Acts of the Apostles. It will say the Acts of the Church. The church was being formed. And uh, some, of the, uh, some of our Pentecostal Bibles will call it the Activity of the Holy Spirit. I kind of like that. Uh, but the, nevertheless, it's what was happening as the formation of the church was in play. As the gospel accounts come to a close with Jesus' ascension, the focus of scripture turns to the works of the Holy Spirit, the works of the church, or the works of the apostles, and others in their effort to spread the good news about Jesus throughout the world and the beginning of the church, which is comprised of Christ's faithful disciples. The historical record of the church in the first 30 years of its history, commonly known as the Acts of the Apostles, is evidently written by Luke. Luke's writing records many of the acts of some of the apostles, principally those of Peter and of Paul, who will become special apostles, and also includes the work of others, such as Stephen, Philip, Barnabas, Silas. More importantly, Luke records the work of the Holy Spirit in the church of the first century. After a brief introduction to his writing, Luke stresses the powerful manifestation of the Holy Spirit in the confirmation and spread of the gospel message. The Book of Acts. It's the second volume of a unified two-part work that today we call Luke-Acts. These were written by the same author, Luke, who was a traveling co-worker with Paul. This is clear from the book's introduction, where Luke says, I produced my first volume, that's the gospel, about all the things that Jesus began to do and to teach. Now Luke's giving a clue here as to what this book of Acts will be about. Volume 1 was about what Jesus began to do and to teach. Volume 2 will then be about what Jesus continued to do and teach. Which leads to a really interesting point about the book's traditional but not original name, the Acts of the Apostles. While different apostles do appear in most of these stories, the only single character who unifies the whole story from beginning to end is Jesus himself, acting directly or through the Spirit. And so the book would more accurately be named The Acts of Jesus and and the Spirit. The book's introduction recounts how the risen Jesus spends some 40 days with the disciples, teaching them about the kingdom of God. This connects back to the story of Luke's gospel, where Jesus claimed that he was restoring God's kingdom over the world, beginning with Israel. So he called Israel to live under God's reign by following him. And he was enthroned as king when he gave up his life and then conquered death with his love. And so the book of Acts begins with the risen King Jesus instructing his disciples about life in his kingdom. So he promises that the Spirit will soon come and immerse them in his personal presence. And this fulfills one of the key hopes from the Old Testament prophets, that in the Messianic kingdom, God's presence, his Spirit, would come and take up residence among his people in a new temple and transform their hearts. And so Jesus says, when this happens, the Spirit will empower his disciples to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. From here, Jesus is taken up from their sight in a cloud. It's an image drawn from the book of Daniel, chapter 7. It shows how Jesus is now being enthroned as the Son of Man who was vindicated after his suffering and now shares in God's rule over the world. And so he promises that he will return one day.
And so the main themes and the design of the book of Acts flow right out of this opening chapter. This is a story about Jesus leading his people by the Spirit to go out into the world and invite all nations to live under his reign. And so the story will begin with that message spreading in Jerusalem and then into the neighboring regions of Judea and Samaria full of non-Jewish people, and then from there out to all of the nations into the ends of the earth. This video is just going to focus on the first half of the book. So the Jerusalem focus section begins with Jesus' followers waiting until the Feast of Pentecost when all of these Jewish pilgrims from all over the ancient world were in the city. And the Holy Spirit comes on the disciples as a great wind and something like flames appear over each person's head and together they start announcing and telling stories of God's mighty deeds. And they're speaking in all of these languages that they didn't know before but all the people gathered there understand perfectly. Now, in order to see what Luke's emphasizing in this story, it's crucial to see the Old Testament roots of all of these images. So first, the wind and the fire is a direct allusion to the stories about God's glorious fiery presence filling the tabernacle and the temple. And it's also connected to the prophetic promises that God would come and live by his spirit in the new temple of the messianic kingdom. And so here in Acts, God's fiery presence comes to dwell not in a building, but in his people. Luke is saying that the new temple promised by the prophets is Jesus' new covenant family, the people of Jesus, which connects to the second thing Luke is trying to say here. So the prophets promised that when God came to dwell in his new temple, he would reunify all the tribes of Israel under the messianic king and that the good news of God's reign would go out and be announced to the nations. Luke describes in detail the international multi-tribe makeup of all of the Israelites who were there at Pentecost and who responded to Peter's message. And so the apostles keep calling Israelites to acknowledge Jesus as their Messiah and thousands upon thousands respond, forming new communities of generosity and worship and celebration. But not everybody's celebrating. From here, Luke shows how Jesus' new family quickly faced hostility from the Jerusalem leaders. With a really beautiful symmetrical design, Luke tells a tale of two temples. So God's new temple, the community of Jesus' followers, they're gathering every day in the temple courts and from house to house. Now, in between those notices are two stories about Peter and the other apostles healing people in the temple courts, only to get arrested by the temple leaders, followed each time by a speech of Peter claiming that Jesus is the true king of Israel. And at the center of all this is a story about Jesus' followers donating property and possessions to a common fund to help the poor which is really cool but it seems kind of random for Luke to mention it here until you realize that this was a practice described in the laws of the Torah and was supposed to be happening through the Jerusalem temple and its leaders. So Luke's point here is clear. The new temple of Jesus' community is fulfilling the purpose that God always intended for the Jerusalem temple, to be a place where heaven and earth meet, where people encounter God's generosity and healing presence. And this conflict between the two temples, it culminates in Acts chapter 6 and 7. It's the first wave of persecution. So Jesus' followers, they continue to multiply, requiring more leaders. And one of these, Stephen, he's a bold witness for Jesus in Jerusalem. And he ends up getting arrested and he's accused of speaking against and even threatening the temple. And so Stephen here gives a long speech showing how Israel's leaders have always rejected the messengers God sent them, including Jesus and now his disciples. So the Jerusalem leaders are enraged. They murder Stephen and they launch a wave of persecution against Jesus' followers that drives most of them from the city. But it has a paradoxical effect. Luke shows how this tragedy actually became the means by which Jesus' people are now sent out into Judea and Samaria. Now in this section, Luke has collected a diverse group of stories that all show how the mostly Jewish, Jerusalem-based community of Jesus became a multi-ethnic international movement. So first is the mission of Philip into Samaria. It's the land of Israel's hated enemies and many of them come to follow Jesus. Next we have the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, later known as Paul. He was the sworn enemy and persecutor of Jesus' followers until he personally met the risen Jesus and he then became a passionate advocate on behalf of Jesus. 
Next is the story of Peter having a vision about how God doesn't consider non-Jewish people ritually impure or unworthy of joining Jesus' family. And so Peter, he's led by the Spirit into the house of a Roman soldier, just full of non-Jewish people, and they all respond to the good news about Jesus. In fact, the Spirit shows up powerfully upon them just as he did to the Jewish disciples back in chapter 2. These themes all come together in the founding of the church in Antioch, the largest, most cosmopolitan city in that part of the Roman Empire. And Luke, he tells us that Barnabas, a Jewish leader from the Jerusalem church, went along with Paul to help lead this church community. And so it became the first large multi-ethnic church in history. It was where Jesus' followers were called Christians for the first time. And it's from here that the first international missionaries were sent out. And so we see Jesus' commission coming true, and this takes us into the rest of Luke's story. But for now, that's the first half of the book of Acts. Okay, and there we have the beginning of the book of Acts. And you guys can pick it up right there. All right. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. As recorded in the gospel accounts, Jesus had told the apostles to wait in Jerusalem until they should receive power from on high, a reference undoubtedly to the power of God's Holy Spirit, which he had promised they would receive. Luke begins his historical record with the account of a special demonstration of God's power in the ministry of the apostles. The occasion is the festival of Pentecost, which is celebrated by the Jews each year 50 days after Passover. Also known as the festival of weeks, the festival was originally given in celebration of the first fruits of the harvest. As one of the three major Jewish festivals, Pentecost attracts large numbers of Jews to Jerusalem from throughout the world. Here, in the midst of a throng of Pentecost celebrants, the Holy Spirit descends in power upon the small band of Galilean men whom Jesus has chosen to be a spokesman. Amazingly, they are heard speaking in all the native languages represented in Jerusalem, declaring the wonders of God. Luke records the sermon preached by Peter, which is a stirring call for the Jews to see Jesus both as the Messiah of prophecy and as the resurrected Lord. When Peter strongly indicts his audience for having played a part in crucifying their Messiah, thousands immediately repent and are baptized. This occasion heralds not only the special power of the Holy Spirit in the ministry of the apostles, but also the formal beginning of Christ's spiritual body, the church. Now when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Pyria and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to the Judaism. Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Mark, I'm stopping for a second. Doesn't this take you back to the Tower of Babel and the splitting of languages and the splitting of people uh, to all the different areas here they're being brought in. Well, it's a great observation. 
um, some, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice and addressed the crowd, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last day, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my serpents, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show the wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire will and billows, billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, then the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourself know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge in you with the help of, the wick, of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Jesus raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me because he is in, at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also rest because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with, with joy in your presence. Hello, Israelites. I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him an oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor his body to see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the, the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all, or for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. <clears throat> and that's our plea today still. <laughs> Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone in need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts and they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Amen. amen. And amen. What a reading. This has got to be maybe one of my favorite spots in all scripture. Um, anything that you wanted to observe? Mark, the one, one thing that, that came out of the, um, 
the video was that part, and we just read about it here right at the end when Amanda was reading about them selling their possessions and giving to the poor, how that was something that was part of the ancient scriptures that the church, that the temple had not been following through on. And here they are fulfilling again scripture right in front of these people. Um, and it had to be quite an affront to, to the religious leaders because they, they had to know and they had to see it, right? Yep. That yep. They, were, they, they were missing it. And here again, we've been kind of slapped upside the head with the reality of what they were missing. Right. Well, one of the things that it, 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 I just couldn't help but reflect on as, uh, as we were hearing that in the video and then reading it again just now uh, was a little bit about last night's finance team meeting. And I, I think it would be really a neat, neat thing if you could share a little bit about what your finance team decided to do in relationship to Ruby's Pantry in relationship to the fact that uh, it would be easy for a lot of reasons, not for, for your team not to have made that decision because finances are so tight. And when finances are tight, the temptation is to hang on to every penny, right? Right. So, so, last night? so the backstory is um, a year ago, uh, the, the finance team had been um, kind of confronted with, with uh, you know, a, a possible decision at one time about building a, a garage and um, for additional storage and things like that. And so the decision was to uh, charge Ruby's pantry uh, rent um, in the same manner that uh, when at one point in time we'd use the armory and there had been some rent that was paid out to the armory. So, so it's, it's something legitimate. It's a legitimate expense to do something like that to charge Ruby's pantry. But we hadn't up until then, but we started charging rent with uh, two things in mind. One was the possibility of building a shed uh, but the other is a possibility of simply having some resources in case there's damage to the building and things like that. And uh, through discussion, um, you know, a request had been made to uh, cease, if you will, with the, um, you know, with the rent payments, uh, in part because we weren't going to build a building because that was no longer needed, and in part because the resources really could be used elsewhere. And so to Mark's point, you know, we had the opportunity because finances are, you know, we haven't really talked a lot about our finances in this study. I think we'll be talking about them at our annual meeting. Um, but, you know, finances are tight, you know, giving is down and, and we still have expenses and things like that. But Mark has shown me a couple of different times that in the midst of this pandemic where, you know, not only do, of course, we have needs, many others have needs and, and they continue to grow. And so here was an opportunity for the finance team to make a decision to either, you know, continue to take rent and, and have it in reserve, so to speak, or to, uh, I'll say, reallocate what, what, uh, what could have been uh, for a building to go back into um, uh, benevolence, outreach, those kinds of things. And so, um, yeah, even, even though times are, are, you know, not as loose, if you will, they're kind of tight, but um, we continue, I think, as a church and through the finance team last night, model that very thing. You know, we're, we're going to take what we have and we're going to use it to minister to others. So, you know, hats off to our folks on the finance team to, uh, you know, see that to see that as a, and it's, we're not talking large, large sums of money. I mean, it's a few hundred dollars, but that's not the point. Uh, the point is, is that spirit of, of um, giving back. Yeah, I think it's generosity. close to a thousand dollars that you're, you're returning from this year's rent collected back to Ruby's Pantry to be able to do benevolent work in this season. And, right. uh, and then not receiving another you know whatever thousands of dollars going forward and i just think it's a real testament to your leadership to say you know what uh, we can't in this season be more focused on what we're getting we have to in this season be more focused on what we're providing and uh and i just love that you brought that level of leadership and, and thoughtfulness to the ministry so the reality though is that here we are in a in a time where um, it would be so easy to think selfishly and the, the very virtue of this kingdom, this upside down kingdom, is that we don't do that. And, 
And, and yet, and it, even as I say that, it, it feels almost disingenuous in as much as we're not at anywhere near the point of, of struggle, even in the midst of a pandemic that the early church would have been at when right. in Acts chapter two, verse 42 through 47, they did, you know, they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching. They devoted themselves to the breaking of bread and to fellowship. They devoted themselves to the um, gathering together in, in homes. And as they're doing that, devoted to the apostles teachings, devoted to the breaking of bread and to fellowship, devoted to being in each other's homes, that God was adding to their number daily, those who were being saved. It's always that we become the community of faith for those who do yet who yet do not know who Jesus is and inviting them into the process of changing the very trajectory of their lives and experiencing the fulfillment of God's Holy Spirit and presence in their lives and them becoming who they were really meant to be from the beginning. And what's great is in the in the in that passage of Acts chapter 2 you've got uh, Peter standing up and preaching that message and I I love to outline that message. Uh, I've talked about it a, a few times in church, but uh, I think the outline for that, for me, that is so powerful is, uh, is Peter gets up and says to those people who have, you know, really relatively recently in Jerusalem re experienced this crucifixion. And he says, A, uh, you killed Jesus. You know, it, just, you want to know what's going on here? Let me tell you what's going on here. The Holy Spirit has moved, and, and I've got a message for you. You killed Jesus, uh, and God raised this Jesus that you killed from the dead. Apologize. <laughs> you know, you're sorry. It's, it, that's the message. Say you're sorry. And, and it's like, the you know, amazing thing in that for me is like, you know, a, you know, a lot of times you have some prophet or teacher or you know wise leader that has died and a movement has formed around the teachings of that wise other person in order to perpetuate what they had gained and gathered from them and uh and so you get you know buddha's teachings and you get the teachings of muhammad and you get these other wise others who who had sayings that the then followers are like we need to keep these sayings alive and I'm always moved by the fact that if that had been the motivation of the apostles of, of the, of this early formation of the church, that they would have gotten up on that first day. Peter should have probably gotten up and said something like, you know, you have heard it said, you know, do not, uh, do not kill, but I'll tell you what our, our rabbi taught us. Don't be angry. I mean, he would have gone back to some of those great fundamental foundational Sermon on the Mount type teachings, you know, and, and he doesn't do that. Instead, he says, you know what, you guys, you blew it. You killed him. God raised him from the dead. And it's time for you to get right with God. And they are so stirred and moved by that. Thousands of them respond by, by asking the question, what do we need to do? And he says, say you're sorry, repent and uh, get baptized, you know, enter into a covenantal relationship with God that begins by the, the fundamental demonstration of your giving up your rights, falling back into the water, falling into a cleansing of sorts, falling into what we used to think of being ceremonially clean, and then come out of that water reflecting the resurrection of Christ and the new life that you have in him. And so demonstrate that you understand that you have given up all authority, all control of your life and, uh, and change your mind and change your heart and follow Christ. And, and thousands of them go, yep, I'm in. Sign me up for that deal. And uh, into the water of baptism they go. It's just a remarkable story then, that then follows with the, and then they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of bread, to the fellowship and to prayer. And uh, it's just like, wow, what, what, well, I think that what amazes me the most. So being the parent of six kids, man, there or four kids, six of us total, no, Adam and kids. Okay. So four kids that I can't even get them to like admit when they're wrong and apologize sometimes when you're like, it's blatantly clear, you know? So I just, I think sometimes, man, 
Peter must have just been so sincere and caring in his delivery of the message because most people, when you say you really messed up and you need to just acknowledge that and change your ways, they get defensive. They become like the Pharisees. They don't want to hear that. They want to shut you up, you know, and that isn't what happened. 3,000. I mean, we think sometimes on our Easter weekend when we get eight new people to Christ, it is like we celebrate and it's amazing. I just can't even fathom. 3,000 people when you've just called them out, you know? So, I mean, I, I really go back to Peter must have just, and I don't even think he was always the most charismatic. I think he was so sincere because as Bob pointed out, he was speaking from personal experience. You know, I betrayed Jesus too. And, and he's forgiving me. So let's, let's do this. <laughs> Well, you know, the whole book begins with this real frustration, uh, I think, of, of sitting together in this upper room and waiting. It's like they're waiting and they're waiting and they're waiting. It's like, you know, it, it, there's so much of ministry where I think one of two things happens. One is that we wind up waiting because we don't know what to do or how to move forward in the, in the spirit. Or number two, um, <laughs> we charge ahead and we don't, we don't actually wait for God at all. And we just go out and in our own strength, try to crank out ministry. And I think some of the benignness of our ministry is that we're out cranking stuff out without the, the power of God inviting us into it and engaging us in it. And I love what Dave, you were, you were reading. So they're, they're out, they're preaching. People are hearing them in their own language. Right. And uh, they get up and they're saying, uh, I'm here in my language, but it sounds like the rest of those guys must be uh, drunk and, 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 you know, I know there's teetotalers amongst us and, and others like that, but uh, don't you, did you just, doesn't it make you smile, Dave, when you're reading uh, his response? No, we're not, we're not drunk. And, and what was the, what was the thing that he points to to legitimize the fact that we're not drunk? Nine o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> he looks at his watch and go, yeah, no, that, well, that can't be. <laughs> that, can't, that can't be the problem. We, you know, the you know the the ale house isn't even open. What are you talking about? <laughs> just the funniest response. And the fact that Luke records that, I just I think is just remarkable. It's like you know what the, you guys recognize, don't you? That this must be a God thing. It, it's 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 only nine. I just think that is hysterical. So well, the doctor in the midst. The doctor says, you've, uh, you, you, you've got it all wrong. It's only nine. But let me, get, let me tell you about, we have been just given a gift from God of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And he, Peter is not usually very uh, uh, easy on people when he comes to them. You know, I was listening to what Amanda said, and you know, he's not usually gentle when he comes down on someone. He's, you know, Peter is a rough guy. He's, you want to fight type of a guy. And yet this message that Peter gave was so compelling, so touching each heart that, like he said, like Amanda said, thousands came to the Lord. And, uh, and they were then gifted the same gift that the apostles were gifted, the presence of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And that is just, that's amazing to me. Well, you know, I, I relate to Peter a little, and I think there was a time when Dustin and I had a conversation about if we were to, you know, really connect our personalities with, you know, someone in scripture. I know he really relates to, to Paul and Paul's redemption and change of his path. And you know, David is one of my favorite characters in the Bible, and I, I love so much of his story. And Dustin said, mm, "But you're not really a David; <laughs> like you're more of a Peter, and more." And I go, "That's awful," because when you look at it for a while, you know, you're like, you look at when he interacts with Jesus, he's so emotional, and Jesus kind of like has to put him back in his place so often, you know. And I'm like, and he denied Jesus. Like nobody wants to be like Peter, and he's like, "No, I mean," but Peter changed, and God really he you know, Jesus met him. He, he'd said, you need to maybe temper your emotions a little, but, but he met him for who he was. And he took those gifts that Peter already had, and he used it for just this amazing, you know, growth for the church. And, 
And I think that's hope for, for people like me that are a little outspoken, a little emotional. And so I think there's a place in scripture for all of us and Jesus meets us there. Hey, that is the note we want to end on, Amanda. Pray that over our church and for those who join us in watching this later. I can do that. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this gathering and this fellowship that we know from reading your books of Acts that you call for and you want us to break bread together and you want us to fellowship together. And we just love this opportunity to commune in your word and to learn together and to be inspired. And we just pray that you bring your spirit down on us and the way you brought it down on that early church and you you bring a new fire to each of our souls to each of our hearts to to just share our love for jesus and the redemptive power of his message and his life with those that we do life with those in our circles those that that we have the opportunity to break bread and to share with and just to see and discern those opportunities and be led by the spirit to further your church and to use the gifts that you've already instilled in us to bring about salvation to those far from Jesus. Watch over us this day. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Hey. You know, one of the things we don't often hear is the health of our church. And that's, that's a positive thing. We don't want to spread rumors around. But for those that are facing the possibility of COVID in their lives and the, those that are suffering or dealing with it, we just stand in prayer for them as well yeah. and asking God's touch on their lives. Uh, we're grateful that we have a church that can come together and be standing together in prayer for those. Yep, keep, mm -hmm. keep people in prayer in this season, that's for sure. Thanks, uh, Pastor Dave and Amanda, for joining us on our study today. We yes. appreciate you two a lot. And uh, as always, to the rest of you, may uh, God bless you and may his light shine on you and give you peace. Have Amen. a great day. Bye, everybody. Have See, you, See you, everyone.